Good afternoon, everyone. I make it two o'clock. So we can start. And welcome to today's meeting of the Combined Power Party of the Governance Committee. As usual, the meeting will be recorded and will uploaded to YouTube. The meeting for viewing. The link is available on the Combined Power Authority website. I ask that all members turn their mobile phones off or ensure that they are turned to silent. We'll have a brief pause while that is certainly taken. We're all happy. Um, I have apologies for all absence. Uh, yeah, we have apologies for Mr. Bannister, Councillor Bantier, Councillor Barton, and Councillor Harvey. We have Councillor Hayden. Councillor Barton. Good afternoon and welcome. Item number two to receive the declaration of the members of interest in respect of the items. Does anyone have any interests in respect of any items on the agenda which they wish to declare? We'll take that as a note. Item three to advise of any other items which the chair has decided to take as urgent. I've not been notified of any urgent items. Chairman's announcements. Um, I have two announcements this afternoon. Firstly, the direct entry station managers. On their recruitment and entry to the service, the two direct entry candidates aligned very well. They have completed their foundation training at the Fire Service College and they will soon begin their command qualifications. This is part of a national program to create a new pathway into the service at middle manager level with the aim of adding diversity in terms of thoughts and skills, as well as physical diversity. Joe and Michelle are very much doing this already. I'm sure we welcome them and wish them all the best for the future in the service. Firefighters' actions. An off-duty firefighter, Martin Khan, was recently in the Winston Nibble Club when a man collapsed. Martin ran to Winston Fire Station collected the fibrillators um, located there. He administered treatment, including shots from the defibrillator, and this brought the man back to life. He was treated by East Midlands Ambulance Service. Undoubtedly, Martin's actions and the use of the equipment saved this man's life, and he is now reportedly in good health. Chair, I just wonder, I think that's not what this is done. Is there any way we can sort of uh, there's a letter waiting on my desk ready to go to him, but I'll, I'll add the fire authorities thanks to that letter as well. Thank you very much, So item number five. So first, we need to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 22nd of November. These are on pages five to ten of your agenda pack. I move that the minutes of the meeting held on 22nd of November 2023 be taken as read. Item number six. The first report on today's agenda is progress against the internal audit plan for 2023-2024. This is on pages 11 to 30 of your agenda pack. Neil Jones, of Internal Audit Services, and Matt Davis, Audit Manager, will present this item. I'll hand over. That's straight on to that. That was pretty good. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good introduction. Follow that. Uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to present the plan for the plan course of this um, thank you committee this time last year. Uh, the end of March, the progress report is on its Moving straight on to paragraph six, we, we talk about the uh, legacy high importance recommendations that are in this uh, committee reading up. It's important to talk about those, but I would sooner talk about them where they are in detail in paragraph 12 onwards. So I'd like to address them there if that's okay. Moving on to the routine progress against plan areas then, uh, we had, we started off with 10 distinct areas to um, auditable areas. Five of them has, have been completed and five are at various stages of work in progress. And I do stress this every time, but they need to be in work in progress towards the end of the year because we need full sample subbodies for some of the work. So um, I'm not worried about the fact that they are work in progress. 
it's important to say that because it can look quite skewed that you might collect it and you've still got pro audits out there. So it's important to mention that, I think. Moving on then to paragraph 12 <coughs> and the uh, partial assurance areas. Just a quick recap for the committee. There were three areas where we've got high importance recommendations. They relate to the contract procedure rules, uh, the ICT controls, and that's particularly in relation to disaster recovery, plans and testing, and then the accounts payables as well, which relates to uh, changes to bank accounts report that's important to uh, be produced. With regard to each specific one then, uh, the contract procedure rules, um, we talked to the committee last committee in November, the fact that um, the implementation dates have changed for these to reflect um, more accurately the work that will be involved. So um, just taking chronological order, training of staff um, should be complete by the end of this month. Uh, signed digital copies of contracts should be complete by the end of next month. Then we've got um, monitoring and reporting training levels and success of training in September. Uh, and then the actual periodic benchmarking in December. And there were reasons explained for that sort of long lead time to the committee previously. Um, the significance of that is, as you'll know, there's nothing that's actually due for this committee, but I just wanted to keep people informed and to also uh, make the committee aware that the, the next report, the um, plan report, and plan for 24-25, there's an entry in there to actually cover off those areas. What I propose to do is obviously I would wait until December to do everything. I'd look at the, um, the March and April ones in the first quarter and then third quarter of September, etc. So um, just bear with me. Screen shrunk, apologies. Um, so with regard to then um, ICT controls, the second high point recommendation that was, as I said, in respect of a disaster recovery plan and testing. Uh, a successful live DR test was undertaken in January. Um, obviously from that you can uh, infer that there's a plan to be able to do that. Uh, we've reviewed this and concluded that subject to the approval of this, this committee, uh, that recommendation can now be closed down to be addressed. It's going to be tested. With regard to the final one, the accounts payables one, uh, the changes to bank accounts report, um, that has not moved forward as quickly as I would like to turn. I'm sure um, officers would have liked to move forward um, quicker as well. There are reasons for that, predominantly um, uh, changing staffing. Uh, it's being tested now in the uh, test environment. It should be, I'm hoping, providing it's successful, it should be rolled <coughs> out and in use by the next committee. But I'll certainly be able to pay for the committee's progress. So, um, in concluding, um, uh, on the whole of the progress we've had before, I'm reasonably happy with the time to complete our 23 24 work and that we'll do things on time or there or thereabouts. Inevitably, I always say this, but the, uh, the, the year doesn't end on the 31st of March. There will be some areas that we have to go through still. And some of it is a bit unpredictable, as you can imagine, um, with, a, with changes in staff and finance function with uh, external auditor um, requirements, with things like um, closing accounts, etc. It's a busy period for them. Um, couple that with the fact that you've got an outsourced uh, pensions system and an outsourced payroll system. We don't have to just go through five stuff. We have to talk to the members as well. So that's why I'm a little bit hesitant on that. But it's where I would want to be, but I can't cast my guarantee that we can finish off in the 31st of March. Um, and then also, we will have so we will have minimal we'll carry forward, but we'll close down uh, subject to approval of this committee um, the recommendation in relation to DR testing. We'll come back and report about the recommendations in respect of bank accounts at the next committee, the July committee, and the contract procedure rules. Obviously, we'll give them a further update then. So, moving in the right direction, there are reasons for. Um, some delays and some hesitancy on my side and actually completing this big pack run by the 31st of March. I'm more than happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Grimmett. Thank, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, it's just good to see the currently disaster recovery uh, implementation. I think you said that at near, near the end. So I know um, um, at Leicester City Council, they, they've been offline for about five days now with uh, a, a cyber attack. They've just had a meeting. 
Um, how sort of confident are, are we that we can get up and running in a sort of quicker time and that sort of five days with all, all the sessions? That's something you do want to throw from the back on. I'm really glad you asked me the question because um, for, for a start, for each year we do PICT controlled work, um, which looks at, made a list here of some of the things, it looks at the governance, uh, the policies, the IT health check vulnerabilities and issues. So, um, flagged up several areas that then basically if they've got any vulnerabilities to, to plug. So, we make sure they're done in a timely manner as part of that work. Um, look at things like user access, major incidents, and how they're dealt with, whether any cyber accreditations have took place, um, patching and upgrades, um, disaster recovery and business cannot continuity, as we've mentioned. Uh, change control um, arrangements, so all things that are live and likely to trigger um, single points of failure. Um, so that's what we do. What we've not done and what we've not got in the plan at the minute is uh, for a more in-depth use of cyber coverage, and that would look at things like who's responsible, cyber risks and reports in cyber training, uh, insurances, whether there's a risk register or there's a specific strategy. So it goes into more depth and um, how cyber incidents are dealt with. Now, um, what I was going to come do when we talked about the plan was, I've not uh, cleared the KICT controls piece of work. I wanted to see whether it came back with any red flags that made me think that actually we need to bring that forward, especially in light of the city situation or not. So um, I was hoping to do that piece of exercise first, sign that report up and see whether I'm happy with it, and then uh, bring back through the offices whether there's a need to actually do a specific piece in cyber, um, either in addition to the current audit plan or in 62 for a job that we're going to um, present in the next paper. So thanks for the question, um, but hopefully that yeah, answers that's enough. And I think they all want to come in as well. You go first, Neil, it's fine. I'm just going to add, obviously, you know, the city and 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 the city. So we have been, as all the teams, for the city and the city, working out our approaches to help them. The IT, we've got a qualified IT audit, uh, and only this morning she told me that I didn't get that. Uh, I don't want to put problem on the spot. Um, in terms of um, the city's, uh, your question was how long we take to recover. Sometimes you are limited by the National Cyber Security Centre. We tell you to take everything down full stop until they're ready to bring it all back. So sometimes it's a little bit that's what my idea would be to do. So, you know, perhaps it's one of the ones that we can do. We're actually in a very healthy position because I've 16 months of staff, we've got three fully qualified IT officers on this training at the moment. So that's unprecedented. It's just really fortunate that we are at the moment. So um, we're all looking at these things very carefully. So. I think it builds quite nicely, actually. Um, the, the honest answer is I don't know, because it would really depend on the type of the attack, how far it got in the system, how long it had been on the system, and which systems it had effective. And I think whatever attack occurs, you'll see a different answer and diff different responses. I think to offer the board some security and to kind of mirror what um, Neil and Matt have said. So I'm leading on behalf of the National Fire Chiefs Council for Digital Technology and Cyber. Um, we've been working very closely with the Home Office, the National Cyber Security Centre. All fire and rescue services have now completed a um, questionnaire framework type thing to establish the base level of cyber securities. The Home Office is very keen to support services that aren't meeting that level to get to the level which will be Cyber Essentials Plus. Um, so there's quite a big bit of work coming through the NFCC, which I think will underscore a lot of the questions you, you might ask in an audit. Um, so I think we'll, we'll probably in the next six months, we'll look at where we are as a sector and compare benchmark where Le Leicestershire Fire and Rescue Service is. I think the bits I would um, offer more assurance to, um, another Fire and Rescue Service about 18 months ago suffered a cyber attack. We've had presentations directly from them and exercises for both from a command point of view, but also from an ICT point of view. And we've been able to put a lot of that learning and experience and procedures in place once we found out about the city um, attack. We were able to kind of really go through quite a good process of scanning our system, identifying if we'd been infected, and then pausing links, closing links. Obviously, we've got quite a lot of links with Leicester City, both ICT and personnel-wise. So we've been able to kind of live through someone else's pain, shall we say, 
um, and come out. I won't say confident because cyber is a raising risk, which we'll actually talk about in the um, organisational risk register, um, whether it be um, ransomware phishing up to and including state sponsored attacks. So it's a, a growing area of risk right here, right now. I think we're OK. I think we've got some work where we could be better. I think that's fair. Um, but direct to answer your question, I don't know how long we would be down if we were to tax. So uh, what the annual plan is, uh, it's the start of uh, the next year's cycle uh, of the audits, which Matt has just been talking about. Now. So what, what it ends up with, and you'll see this at the July committee, is we then end up with an annual report. So it's been an annual report to the committee, uh, and that gives an opinion on the overall uh, control environment, the adequacy of the control environment. So that's, that's why we do our plan. And Matt is just going to explain a little bit about how to work yeah, thanks, thanks Andy. Um, going straight into the executive summary, which I think that, um, covers everything off quite nicely actually. Um, paragraph 6, oh, first of all apologies, obviously that should have been 24, 25, there's a typo there, not 23, 24. Um, but, so apologies for that, but the rest of the paragraph is important to know, as much as some of the consultation process, so as we can talk with the treasurer, with the monitoring officer, with the senior management here, we look at the latest risk registers. Um, we do comparisons with uh, Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire. Uh, obviously, they're on a totally different journey. But so I think it's in terms of you know whether there's any areas actually they're looking at, not doing anything, so whether there's any trends that we're missing, or whether it's just because it's a particular project that's important to them that they're less than a peer, etc. So we do that. There's far more to it than that. You know, we analyse all the risk registers and look at changes and things like that. You'd imagine we look at. Um, corporate publications from the Institute of Internal Auditors on key risks, two of which are cyber and uh, human resources and got things related to that, I can't say. Um, but that's just an overview of it. Um, paragraph 7 then talks about um, Neil needing a rep coverage to give his head of audit opinion and how we cover off the three distinct areas, as I'm sure you're aware of, government's risk management and internal control and then how that feeds into the overall annual governance statement. Then uh, we like to uh, sort of put things in categories. So in paragraphs eight and nine, we talk about the breadth of coverage that it covers core areas. And I think it's important to note that within the core area, is um, counter fraud work through the National Fraud Initiative 
And if we found anything out there that was needed further work, we could, we'd look at that. You know, we'd buy some time in the plan to actually look at that. So it's not just that, you want to follow up, we investigate the work that's done, etc. Um, yeah, so core areas, uh, service specific areas, so particular projects that are ongoing at the minute, uh, and then key risk areas, which you will see there, jump balls, no surprise, things like that in the plan. Um, I'm at pains to say it's a plan. I always say this, it's out of date, on, potentially out of date on day one, and discussions here, it may even be earlier than that, because <laughs> uh, cyber work through. Um, but we will flex the plan as need to be and we have discussions and there's a prep for and obviously we've got those discussions and I'll be talking to Callum just as an example, going back to the cyber example. Uh, we actually uh, measure against cyber essentials plus what Callum's just mentioned. So uh, we wouldn't want, if we did do some work, we wanted it to be timed, there's no good thing when they're doing their own benchmark in the end stage. Um, and then we're obviously we want it to be meaningful, so if there was output report that actually showed that they've benchmarked on what they've done, and we can take short from that, we wouldn't just do it for the sake of it. Um, so that's important to mention. Uh, but as paragraph, I think paragraph 24 to me, and sums it all up, right, the conclusion of that paragraph where it says, uh, it aims to give the CFA optimal internal audit coverage with the resources available. So it's an 85 day plan, and it's quite a cross cutting area. Um, I'll hand it back over to Neil to talk about our external quality assessment and the audit has been audited and the internal audit charter as well before we'll be glad to take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, just, so, so thanks, Max. So yeah, so, uh, it is a requirement, those public sector internal audit standards I mentioned earlier, it's a requirement every five years we have to have an independent assessment of conformance uh, to the standards. Uh, five years ago we, we did well, we got the uh, top rated on that, so hopefully again, Taking that. Um, the approach that we've chosen uh, it has been approved by members of the County Council's Public Audit Committee. Um, so we, we, we've chosen the same uh, route as we did before, which is an independent uh, assessment of a, a sort of self evaluation. I was asked at one committee why we've chosen that group one the um, There is a cost involved, so it, 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 that is important. But also the scope of the uh, independent evaluation. This time now uh, will be considerably wider than what it was before. So, not leaving any, you know, any to chance it's going to be a good thing. Uh, fire authority won't incur any direct cost on that. Um, where you may get involved is, and I think Chair and Colin uh, probably mentioned, um, so the assessor uh, is at liberty to um, send you a self assessment questionnaire or look at that answer. Just hopefully, if he does, we can say the nice things. <laughs> of course. Um, so, uh, we've already sent some stuff off to the assessor. Um, uh, he's doing a readiness check on that. Uh, we're probably a little bit later in terms of where we are with the report, and that might be able to get that. Hoping to bring something back to this committee in July. Uh, and then the final part of the, of the report um, just mentioned because of going through the uh, assessment again, you saw it was proven to uh, review what they call the internal audit charter, which again is another you know, the requirement of the standards. And that's a key governance document that sets out uh, how internal audit uh, works with this committee, with the senior officers, with the senior officers. So um, paragraphs 28 and 9, I'm not going to go on it, explain the purpose of it. Uh, it does require approval by this committee. Uh, and then we make very minor changes, very minor changes, uh, and I've highlighted those yellow in appendix to which starts on page 43. Um, so I think that's what we've got to say really in terms of the reports and how to take questions. Thank you gentlemen. Any questions? Okay. Okay. I'll well, move back. Okay. The internal audit plan 2024 25 be noted and that the detail of the plan may change during the year in response to emerging issues and risks. And B, as part of its function to monitor the, the adequacy and effectiveness of the internal audit service, the committee, one, notes the plans for an EQA of LCCIAS, and two, approves the revised internal audit charter for the CFO. <coughs> and I have a second here, please. Committee, those in favour, please show. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Chair. Uh, we haven't prepared that all of our conversations are overlap and intertwine, and um, but you'll probably hear quite a lot of similarities around what uh, Neil and Manager's been talking about and what the organisational risk register talks about, which should be reassuring in some ways. So as part of our regular update to Corporate Governance Committee, this paper presents the updated organisational risk register. It kind of comes in three component parts. One is the corporate risks facing the organisation. Part two is the project risks. And then part three is health and safety risks uh, specific to the kind of area we operate, but also the legislative responsibilities we have. Um, a high level overview of the changes is contained on pages um, 54 and 55 of your bundle, uh, basically paragraph 14A through to 14L. Um, members will see that there have been some new risks added um, and it's quite timely really as the full CFA approved our new community risk management plan at its last session. These risks now underpin each one of those strategies, kind of showing that golden thread of it's important enough for us to shape our organisation for the next four years. It's really important enough that we monitor those risks on a regular basis and demonstrate how we're complying <coughs> against them. Um, what I would say is, and it is, is what Neil and Matt have just said, really, um, the world is becoming a riskier place. That is recognised in the national risk assessment published by the UK government with an increasing number of risks, increasing number of severity and increasing likelihood of impact. That was published in late 2023. The National Risk Register, can't even say it, National Risk Register is then taken by the local area, in our case, Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland's LRF, analysed and the local interface is put on that around our communities, our demographics, that forms the community risk register. Um, our officer who wrote this paper, Stuart Brewer, is one who's put an awful lot of work into that. Once you've got the national and the local risk registers, obviously we have our organisation risk register just beneath that, which takes into account our statutory duties under the Fire and Rescue Services Act, Civil Contingencies Act, and any other relevant legislation. And that's what's um, kind of presented to you here today. You'll see within our um, organisation risk register, there's some clear carry downs from the national assessment, such as cyber attack, uh, pandemic diseases, and then some much more local ones regarding our mobilising system and industrial action. Um, overall, I'm comfortable with the progress uh, against the risks and the mitigations work we're putting in place. And I do expect at the next meeting, we will see two of the major risks come significantly down relating to the mobilising system. As I'm sure the, the authority will be aware, decision was taken uh, about a year ago to replace the mobilising system. That project is proceeding exceptionally well. Um, I had an ambitious timeline. It looks like it's going to deliver ahead of that timeline, which is best for our risk register, but more importantly, it's better for the community that we're serving and getting fire engines to them. Um, the full report is detailed in page 59 to 58, which you can peruse at your leisure. Um, and before I move on to take any questions, I'll just focus on paragraph 14i, the industrial action risk that is evident. Um, this is a dynamic area for, for areas we hadn't necessarily foreseen. So the risk and likelihood of industrial action remains relatively low, but there is some new legislation published by the government uh, around the minimum service level bill that's currently working its way through, which has the potential to alter the, the paradigm in that area, really. Um, at the moment, we are required to make a um, provision, even in the event of industrial action, to maintain 25% of our fire cover. We do that through a contract with a third party provider. The new minimum service um, bill is actually changing the legislation, or looking to change the legislation around that, where we could 
increase that to 73% appliance availability using work notices. That has some potential benefits to the authority in around a, a contract saving, but it also has some potential challenges um, as I believe the trade unions are quite um, against this legislation change and dependent where government goes in the near future, that legislation may be repealed at some point in the future. So we're, it's kind of a waiting game at the moment just to make sure we take the right approach in a methodical way forward without severing a contract that we might need to reinstate later down the line. Um, it's more for this committee's kind of understanding and awareness rather than a decision point at the moment. But obviously, as we um, undertake an awful lot of the work around that, we'll probably bring back either to corporate governance or the CFA, depending on um, the decision that we're looking to take. So it's just to kind of um, raise the awareness of that. And there is an awful lot of work contained behind the scenes of that, which we're um, working through at the moment. Um, happy to take any questions, Chair. Yeah. In which case, uh, I'll move to note the content of the report and the organisational risk register. <coughs> Those in favour of adopting the report. I'll move on to item number nine, which is the final item on today's agenda. And this relates to the agenda pay gap report for 2023 24. Uh, Callum, over to you again for this one. Thank you, Chair. Um, before I begin the report, I'd just like to welcome Isla Dixon to the meeting. Isla's our qualities um, officer and will answer any technical questions you have around that area and what we're doing now and how we're moving forward. But just thought it particularly relevant to have Isla with us today in, in case of the some inevitable questions regarding this report. So um, as required under the Equality Act, all public sector businesses who employ over, is it 250 people? Um, have to uh, publish their gender pay gap on an annual basis and this reports cover that. Uh, this has to be submitted to central government by the end of the financial year, but is actually for the preceding year to the date that you're submitting it for. Um, traditionally, um, corporate governance have always been presented this report before we upload the figure. Um, and I am presenting this report to you in the um, spirit of transparency and openness today. The figures in the report feel very, very inaccurate and wrong to me. Um, but what I don't have is the ability to tell you exactly what the figure is. We've seen the data, we've now looked at the data yesterday and it feels very off skewed. We've gone from a, a roughly speaking 8% gender pay gap up to around 30, 31%. That doesn't feel correct for how the organisation is, how we've improved the diversity in the organisation over that time period. Um, but I'm presenting it to you. I haven't pulled the report because I think it's important members know we are looking at this and it doesn't feel very right to us. I do think, again, in the, the spirit of honesty, I do think the gender pay gap is likely to have increased this year simply because of the way pay awards are bargained at a national level and how they've been implemented in two separate ways. Um, but I didn't want to hide this away. I, I think it's fair to say we're, we're revisiting these figures and I haven't been able to do it for this meeting. It will be down to the correct standard before we submit to government. And with your permission, Chair, I would prefer to bring a report back to you at the next meeting, irrespective of the figure, if it be up, down or indifferent. I have low confidence in these figures at the moment, but equally didn't just want to hide them away um, as they may turn out to be correct later down. But it, it doesn't look like it, it doesn't smell like it, it doesn't taste like it to me. It feels very, very wrong. But in the, in the spirit of transparency, I wanted to put that in the purview of corporate governance. Qualities officer, yes. Yeah. Yes, I'll meet you online, so nice to meet you in, in person. Thank you. Yes. I would like to sort of see what more we can done to actually reduce this this payment. So I think in fairness, um, of course, we'll, we'll arrange the meeting. Um, 
once we've got the updated figures, I think we can have a, an informed decision around that. But I th I'd like to suggest some of the stuff we said in the chair's announcements around direct entry at middle manager level, increased positive action that we're doing. We are improving the diversity, not as quick as any of us would like, that's fair to say. Um, let's get the right figures and then we'll have the conversation, whatever the figures may be. if I can just say and I think Councillor Newton it's important it covers our entire workforce yes. and I think when you look at the amount of females yes. we have in our support staff yes. we have to bear in mind the the pay scale yes. differences yes. that will come in that so yes. I think it's just important that we understand it's our entire workforce not just our operational side which we are doing work on and I've shared certainly with the um, senior leadership team the number of females that we're starting to see and how that's grown mm -hmm. But it is important we also balance that with our support staff side where we do have that that pay differential um, and that will obviously impact how that works out. Well, I think I have noticed too, Mildred, that there was a very part-time as well. So the part-time instructors is an additional contract that they take on board. So they will still have their main contract, but it's an additional contract we give them. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Absolutely. And uh, as I said, Chair, irrespective of what the number settles on, we'll bring the report back to give it proper scrutiny of this committee. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Um, if there's no further questions. Chair, yep. I, I do have a question. I'm afraid it relates to the previous agenda item. Is that permissible or do I have to hold on top? That's absolutely terrible. Go for it. <laughs> okay, uh, maybe my brain just works a little slower than everyone else does, so it takes me a while to catch up. Um, in relation to the risk register, I'm looking through the, the chapter three health and safety risks. Uh, it, it seems to me that there are, you're carrying quite a, uh, I guess, troubling cocktail of individual risks there. And I guess if I look at them in aggregate, <clears throat> I wonder whether taking them in the round, that level of exposure that that presents to firefighters, whether in your view that's tolerable. I think um, it, it's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, the environments we operate in are inherently dangerous. We get called to places where people's safe systems of work have failed or events have happened that have created a failure situation. Um, the environment of firefighting, just because it's someone, it is full of contaminants. And we quite rightly have to face that risk. We're a fire rescue service. We, we are there to put fires out. So we kind of accept that. I think the, the bigger challenge for us is not necessarily exposing staff to contaminants, but it's how our safe system to work regarding that afterwards are put in place, maintained, and then the human behaviours relating to that as well. Um, I think all fire and rescue services will face these risks, and I think in most areas we're ahead of the curve, in some areas we're on the curve, and a couple of areas we could probably do a bit more to, to get onto the curve. Um, I think that they are tolerable at the moment, but the amount of work going on in your organisation, particularly around projects of contaminants to reduce those risks where we can um, is is about right for what we can do at the moment. Um, but I have to be honest with you, we operate in a risky environment and those risks seem to be changing. Um, lithium ion batteries, scooter fires, those risks are becoming higher, it feels like. Um, what I would say is our training provision and our staff are excellent, they're passionate, they care about what they do and they are very, very proficient in the operational environment to minimise these as best as possible. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we can never remove them. That, that's the idea with the risk, isn't it, to remove it, but because of the nature of our business, we can't. Yeah, I, I completely understand the inherent, I guess, inherently dangerous nature of the work, but I guess, you know, it wouldn't be right if this was a, a cry for help to say that firefighters need more support in making these risks or at least minimising more effectively avoidable risks. Yeah. And I think that should be perfectly clear at this level of, of scrutiny that whether this is just ambient background dangerous nature of the work or whether there's more yeah. that can be done. Uh, excellent follow on question and it will come to fire authority at some point. Um, for years now we've been developing and, and Carl Bowden's been leading on it for us the new learning and development training facility that is becoming more and more important and as we move through hopefully the coming months we'll get to a decision point on that but we we recognize our training provision is adequate at the moment for that i would prefer it to be better than adequate i think that's right and that is going to need some investment on financial time and effort to be perfectly honest with you so.